Welcome everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are today. So we are going to start with this uh, round table with uh, very high level speakers. So let me start from the beginning, thanking all of them for their participation. This round table is promoted in the context of the T20, which is the official engagement group of the G20. We are producing research-based policy recommendations for the G20 leaders, but we want to include and add new voices to the recommendations we can provide to the G20 leaders. And of course, the very success of the G20 depend on uh, the interaction among uh, three big players uh, in the context of the G20 uh, itself, uh, which are, of course, the United States, China, and uh, the European Union. So today we will focus uh, precisely on, uh, uh, on this, on this very difficult interaction, which was already extremely difficult uh, in the past, but which may turn out to be even more difficult uh, in the post-pandemic uh, in the post-pandemic uh, context, with growing tensions, with growing competitiveness, and also some fears that it could be, in a way, also the end of globalization as we uh, we know it. So let's try to understand exactly what can be done, also to lower tensions, what are the areas, the fields of, co of collaboration among uh, these three actors, and what is also the potential impact, uh, uh, what are the consequences also for uh, uh, the other countries, for including, of course, developing uh, and least developed countries. So, without further ado, I now turn uh, uh, to uh, great experts, uh, first to Franco Bruni, who is the ESP Vice President and co -chair, uh, lead co-chair of our Team 20 Task Force on uh, International uh, Finance. So I start with, uh, with Frank and then I move to Daniel Gross. Please, Franco, let's try to have a broad overview of what's going on today. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, well, the world is now in a tricky combination of risks and opportunities. Uh, it must overcome the pandemic shock, but also improve on the three pre-COVID challenges of globalization, technological change, and demographic evolution. The pandemic has, has added a specific sanitary wound to the pre-existing fault lines, as Raghuram Rajan called them, that for at least 25 years were only superficially detected, studied, and cured. With part of the cure, purely symptomatic, unable to tax and redistribute to the wounded, mostly based on a covering up of the wounds with enormous amounts of debts that will complicate the navigation of the world economy and keep it more fragile for many years in the future. The most common narrative presents globalization, technological change and demographic evolutions as excessive, hurting the weaker parts of our countries and populations. And as the narrative goes, these challenges should be resisted and protected and, and by protecting the pre-existing situations and closing the windows from where the winds of change are coming. A greater emphasis on national interests look thus natural. There are many mistakes in this narrative. First, globalization has not been progressing undisturbed with excessive liberalizations and market-oriented freedom. There are all sorts of interferences and often the wrong ones. The world has been for many years far from free trade. Protectionism has been with us with distortions and of competition all over the place, including lack of adequate antitrust and pro-level playing field policies. Truth is that there is no good multilaterally agreed governance of an increasing interdependent world. Second, what is at stake are the enjoyment of global public goods like growth, stability, and peace. Concentrating on national interests cannot provide the right amount of public goods. Cooperation is indispensable. The pandemic shock is a very evident example of this as it stresses that health is a global public good. Third, in order to cope with the winds of change, closing the windows is a losing strategy. The winds will pass the closed windows and closures will make the house fall down. Changes will 
any way take place, in a distorted and undesirable way. We must welcome the winds and master them. In particular, we need to protect people with what I would call help to change welfare systems. Liberal policies have nothing to do with the lack of welfare. As there is no true market without rules and regulations, there is no market without welfare and without help to change welfare in particular. The experience with social dumping has taught us that coordination and minimum international harmonizations are important also on the welfare front. Global cooperation seems now to involve three protagonists, US, China, and Europe. Their leadership is important for the G20 when it tries to cope with the most huge and truly global problems. Well, they are three, these protagonists, but perhaps four. Russia is economically smaller than Germany, but its strategic importance cannot be forgotten. A non-cooperative game of three, where two can coalesce, is often more dangerous for the weaker players than a game of four, which is also more easily widened in a multilateral cooperative game. Some talk about a potential G2. The US-China relationship, be it hostile or cooperative, is crucial, but less so if one considers that the world is much wider and variegated. Regionalization could deeply transform the governance of the global economy and the role of the regional centers. The relationships among the most powerful countries should often take place on separate tables where distinct problems are dealt with. Muscular confrontation on some tables with the adoption of hostile measures should not prevent smoother diplomacy and cooperation on other tables. Reaching separate compromises on different tables also allows to limit the use of what is often called constructive ambiguity, which is, takes away transparency to the whole thing, but has to be used in some, on some tables and is more productive you know, playing on many tables than trying a general compromise where peers and apples get confused in unreasonable ways. Well, let me also stress that fi the financial table is particularly important. Money, credit, capital are the most pervasive and unstoppable channels of globalization. They need to be monitored and regulated in a credible multilateral way to avoid major disasters or financial instability and undesired obstacles to all sorts of global activities. This is the task of our uh, task force, by the way. Let me end by saying that the e European Union can have a crucial role in framing sound multilateralism. Its strategic autonomy is not incompatible with solid Western solidarity. As far as economics is concerned, US and the Union should work out an optimal mix of their respective strong points and best practices. Reliance on markets, incentives, decentralization, individual risk-taking, this is typical of the US tradition, mix it with the ambition of people first, uh, of, uh, ambition to provide first-class public goods and services and good welfare. And this is more the typical ambition of the European side. Both the US and the EU should then keep updating their organization to cope with a continuously changing world, possibly using help to change policies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank, and thank you also for, uh, of course, at the beginning, highlighting the importance of cooperation among these three protagonists, three plus one, if we include also uh, Russia, and also for uh, uh, highlighting the importance also of working on different tables. Uh, and we had, of course, uh, just a few days ago, the example of the conference, of Biden's conference, for instance, on uh, environment with, you know, it was, it was not a case, these protagonists together. So now let me move to, uh, to Daniel. Uh, Daniel Gross is member of the board and distinguished fellow at the Center for European Policy Studies uh, in Brussels. Uh, Daniel, do you buy it? I mean, is it still possible? What is the extent of the cooperation that we can see among these three actors? Please, Daniel. Thanks a lot, Antonio. It's a pleasure to be in this really exceptional group of uh, people to discuss uh, these current developments. Let me perhaps start by striking a more positive note uh, on globalization and the danger of fragmentation. 
And also to immediately react to your question, as an economist, uh, I'm used to think as individuals and also governments as acting in their own interest. Uh, so they cooperate usually when it's in their own perceived uh, national interests. And uh, I think uh, that is what we should ask us always. What are the interests governments perceive at this point in time and does it push them to cooperate or to strengthen what has always been called this multilateral trading system? And uh, I think when one does that, one finds that the three pillars right, of the Troika that you mentioned uh, are, have different starting points uh, and somewhat different interests. But uh, before coming to that, it might be useful to take also a look at where we are right now and what did not happen over the last decade. We had a very deep financial crisis and economic recession already 10, 12 years ago. And many predicted that this would lead to a very important recourse to protectionism. That, by and large, did not happen. I'm not saying zero, but very little happened. And that's actually some papers right now that say, why did nothing happen, right? So that means that either we have a pretty strong system as it is, or uh, governments actually perceive that it was not in their interest uh, to take uh, too many protectionist measures. And my impression is that right now we are finding something similar. We, of course, had lots of headlines about fights about uh, protective equipment last year. But remember, that lasted for six weeks and then it was basically gone. And now, of course, we have reactions about uh, vaccine exports and components and patents. And I would say, hopefully, that will also last uh, very, very little. But across the board, one doesn't see a lot of recourse to protectionism. And therefore, I would say, actually, uh, globalization, trade will bounce back and will be part of the recovery. But the part it plays is very different across the three uh, EU, China, and US that you mentioned earlier. And uh, we find that the EU is by far the most open economy of the three. And this is what makes the EU also a weak actor, if you want, because the EU cannot really use the threat of taking trade measures uh, against others, because the impact on the EU economy would be very strong. Whereas if you take a rather less open economy like the United States, there it's easier uh, to have uh, to use trade policy for other means, uh, because it is a smaller part fewer jobs are at stake. Adam Posen has recently published a very good analysis, an excellent analysis of uh, the EU open, <laughs> the openness of the United States, sorry. And I think he will say more about that. Uh, so uh, I think actually what we find is this, all this talk about globalization, it's actually true for the EU, which has become much more open, less so for the US. And then we have China, which actually has uh, gone over a hump, so to speak. Uh, for China, uh, globalization and trade was extremely important with a trade to GDP ratio above 30% 12 years ago, 10 years ago. But now China becomes less open. But again, this is an economic force. This is not a political choice. As the Chinese economy becomes bigger and also technologically more sophisticated, uh, many of the inputs which were formerly imported and then assembled can now be produced locally. You all remember this famous example of an iPhone where whatever, it's very small percentage was value added was created in China, but this is changing. This is not the true picture of the Chinese economy today and also going forward. So we are facing therefore a world uh, dominated by three entities where one is rather closed and sees if you want trade, if you want more from the political point of view, that's the US. The EU, which depends for its growth on exports and therefore would like to have a strong multilateral trading system, 
but it has very little power about the others. And finally, China, which uh, was a big benef a beneficiary of this open trade trading system, but which is becoming so big on its own that it depends less and less uh, on access uh, to that uh, multilateral system. And I think these are the three different driving forces which dominate the choices being made uh, by uh, the leaders in these uh, three regions. And that's what we should keep in mind. Um, overall, the EU will keep pushing for an open system, but the decision is much more in Washington and Beijing. Okay. As always, you have been very, very clear. I appreciated at the beginning your optimism, but you know, at the end, it was not so optimistic as you said at the beginning. But it looks like in what you said, and that was your conclusion, that the most vulnerable, vulnerable actor among the three is the EU. So let me now turn immediately, of course, to somebody who really knows the EU because it has a great career and a great experience uh, inside the European institution, Marco Brute. Let me thank you, Marco, also for helping us building this, uh, this initiative. So very, thank you very much uh, indeed. So Marco, now let's move to one of these uh, three protagonists, uh, the one that Daniel described as the most vulnerable uh, protagonist, the European Union. What's your view on this? Please, Marco. Oh, thank you very much, Antonio. Uh, thanks for the invitation. It's a, a great pleasure. Uh, starting has been identified that the most vulnerable uh, is uh, not particularly pleasant. Uh, and I would actually dispute a bit that, uh, in a sense that uh, if you look at the uh, arguments of uh, Daniel, I agree uh, that we depend more in Europe from the overall context. At the same time, if you look at the agenda uh, at the global level, it is very European, uh, but let me let me uh, go in an orderly uh, fashion. Uh, I would like to ask uh, um, what does the pandemic shock uh, bring uh, to uh, say global governance and global relations? The first one is to look at the policy response to the COVID uh, uh, crisis. And here you have the uh, response that is essentially the domestic one and the global uh, agenda. In order to save time, I have uh, tried to encapsulate the uh, uh, domestic uh, response into a slide, which uh, I am not sure it is uh, visible. It is. Uh, it is. It is uh, visible there. So what I have done here in a purely subjective manner, I have uh, um, uh, positioned the uh, countries, uh, um, so US, China, uh, I put the UK also here, and the uh, and the oval of the uh, of the EU along uh, these two dimensions. One is uh, uh, the boundaries between the markets and the state. Uh, that's the horizontal axis, and the vertical axis is the priorities of let's say efficiency allocation versus equity redistribution. And, and um, we can uh, discuss whether the uh, the you agree on the direction and the extent, let's say, of the arrows um, that I put, uh, I put there. So basically what we have had is move to the left uh, of the Western world. Um, the US uh, uh, here, we should not be mistaken, it doesn't move exactly to the origin of this graph here, but that's the sense of direction. Uh, it has become much more European. Uh, and actually, if you look at the Biden agenda, you know, looking forward, uh, I think it is. It may even cross the um, enter the European quadrant. Um, China has not moved really. Uh, so this is the way I would uh, characterize the domestic uh, uh, response. Beside this, you have the global response. You can take away the slide. Uh, I think is uh, not uh, useful uh, anymore for the rest of my uh, of my talk. So at the global response. Uh, um, I look at the, uh, essentially the role of the G20. Uh, let me uh, just uh, capture this uh, in, uh, in uh, a bit of a slogan. Uh, role of the G20 in managing the COVID crisis, we had neither London nor Toronto. What does it mean? It means we have not had the April uh, 2009 London summit, which uh, with the tripling of resources of the IMF, uh, 
you know, was uh, a key uh, response to the crisis. But we had, uh, we didn't have Toronto either. Toronto was in April, in June uh, 2010, where uh, the G20 declared victory. We are out of the crisis. We can start withdrawing policy support, which in retrospect was a huge uh, mistake. So I think uh, this has, uh, uh, so the, the low key, lower key role of the G20, whilst at the same time, I think with some uh, decisions like uh, on the COVID-19, on the debt service suspension initiative, actually, uh, in a, you know, not very visible manner made, uh, I think, uh, useful uh, contributions. And now we'll have to see whether we can uh, consolidate this under the Italian uh, presidency. So that's the, I think, how in a nutshell I would characterize the policy uh, response. The second issue here is what does the, um, uh, what difference does the pandemic uh, make? I think here, uh, what, uh, that's my, let's say, personal view, the pandemic has led, I think, to the emergence of a number of fundamental global commons. What are the global commons? Uh, I think I would, one can list several, but I would, I would uh, uh, retain four. One is clearly public health. This is going to be, let's say, in a sense, a persistent threat looking forward. So it has become a global, uh, I think, a global common. But there was a disarray in the response in the first place. I think uh, then eventually we found a way towards, uh, uh, let's say, a more cooperative uh, uh, handling uh, of, uh, uh, of this, or semi-cooperative, let's put it like that. I think this, this is one. The second one, not I think not talked enough, is global digital infrastructure. This is this has been during COVID the survival kit of the global economy and the global society also. Uh, I mean, we went to work online immediately. Had we had a collapse of uh, the global digital infrastructure, I think we would not be here talking at this seminar. First of all, uh, and uh, and second, uh, clearly the impact uh, uh, and would have been considerably stronger than uh, it has been, uh, though dramatic as it has been. I think we should not take for granted that the resilience of global uh, digital infrastructure should be there uh, regardless. So this is the second common. Uh, the third common, I think, is global is taxation. Here, I think we have a chance now for a good story. I follow uh, I follow Daniel in a bit of an optimistic uh, uh, mode here. I think the um, for, for the point of view of uh, rebuilding after the crisis, for the emergence of uh, responding to equity considerations, uh, I think this is uh, it's an important uh, uh, avenue. And I think here the change of position of uh, uh, the Biden administration on the OECD G20 forum, pillar one, pillar two, uh, I think it gives a very concrete uh, um, perspective of, of having an agreement on that. And I think on this, I was talking before of European agenda, I think this is something that the EU has been pushing forward very much. And last, definitely not least, is the climate change. Again, here is a natural global common I think the European agenda here also has been uh, um, has uh, set up the tone at the global level. Again, I think the uh, China, but in lately the uh, U.S. Uh, coming back to the uh, you know, Paris Agreement, I think is uh, is a uh, is a positive uh, uh, element. A lot of work. I think we are going to come up uh, in June with a number of proposals on what we call the package of fifth for fifty five for 2030, um, that is, uh, I think, is very uh, ambitious. Finally, on the EU perspective on the, uh, going forward, I think uh, Dan is right, uh, uh, um, uh, Franco very much uh, also. I think the EU will continue to strive for inclusive multilateralism. Uh, I think there is there uh, a clear demand for Europe. Uh, I think, um, I look at Carmen, uh, uh, 
um, I mean, uh, uh, emerging economies, but also uh, advanced economies, uh, uh, you know, smaller, but think about Australia, Korea, they don't want to be sandwiched uh, between the China and the, on, and the US. So there is a clear demand for Europe being more, um, uh, I think, more present and setting uh, the tone. The name of the game uh, we have encapsulated into the what we call the open strategic autonomy, uh, so which takes into account of the higher fragmentation that we have uh, at the global uh, level uh, and pursuing multilateralism certainly, but in uh, in a sense in a less uh, um, let's say naive uh, manner. And uh, the recent trade uh, policy review, but also the uh, last week the industrial strategy the screening and the notification of foreign subsidies, uh, I think they set the tone for what uh, uh, open strategic autonomy uh, would be. Uh, this would go hand in hand with uh, bilateral and plurilateral uh, arrangements um, with China, with the US, but also with other partners. We have uh, tomorrow the e uh, summit with, uh, with India. All this and I conclude on this point, uh, and it's a, it's a message I don't give to you, actually I give to myself, uh, is that we have to do our, our homework for that. Uh, so on this, we can project strong uh, strength, strength at the, uh, on the external side if we are cohesive and, co and coherent domestically. This implies continue to support the recovery uh, through, let's say, indigenous strategy, uh, not relying on the rest of the world to pull us uh, out of the recession, but also reopening the chantier of uh, EMU, Banking Union, pursuing, as I said, the global uh, digital agenda, strengthening the international role of the euro. So this domestic agenda is actually essentially to, uh, you know, co connected to the global ambition of Europe. Thanks. Thank you very much, Marco. Uh, Marco is head of cabinet of the European Commissioner for uh, Economy. Um, uh, thank you also, Marco, for highlighting what you consider, you know, the global commons. So global health, global digital infrastructure, taxation, climate change. So now let me move to Adam Posen. If we list this, you know, global commons, so what is the U US perspective and uh, also what are the expectations from the rest of the world on the US after the, you know, this dramatic actually shift from the Trump era to Biden's era with this, you know, sort of uh, uh, description of Biden as the new messiah of uh, multilateralism. It's going to be like this. So let's have your point of view. Uh, let me just remind that Alan Posen, everybody knows him, but he's president of the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Please, Adam. You're muted, muted. please. Thank you very much, and thanks to Franco Brudi and ISPI for having me. Um, I have a lot of overlap with my friends and colleagues, Franco, Daniel Gross, Marco Brudi, but coming from the U.S., I, I, I fear that I am a bit more pessimistic, or at least I'm, I'm a bit more pessimistic about the U.S. role. Um, so I'm a I'm an opponent of Trump, but I am not an employee of Biden, um, and the so let me try to make clear what that means. Um, I think the emphasis on the global commons, uh, as the pre previous speakers mentioned, and about the important swing role of the EU that, as Daniel said, is a little bit more vulnerable than US and China, but still has quite a bit of autonomy and quite a bit of strategic role is the right framework. Um, the US uh, under Biden is obviously far better as an international actor and better for its people than under Trump. But the changes are far more domestic and domestically focused than international. Um, Daniel kindly mentioned my new foreign affairs article with colleagues from the Peterson Institute. We've documented that actually the US on many dimensions has been withdrawing from globalization for roughly 20 years. Trump made it much worse. Trump made it much less humane. Trump was more incompetent. But uh, when you look at the Biden agenda, on trade, on immigration, on foreign direct investment, on relations with China, on for that matter, relations with the EU, 
it is um, still confrontational. It is still not very multilateral. The difference is it's not avowedly against multilateral law. It's not avowedly against European governance, I mean, excuse me, not European, global economic governance, or against the EU. But it does carry over, I think, two sad continuations from, by, from Trump and from before. The first is an extremely suspicious, conflictual view of China. And um, this is unchanged, uh, largely. If anything, in some ways, it's more conflictual because the Biden administration, as Chinese leadership had feared, um, cares much more about human rights than the Trump administration did. Um, and, and the second point, the continuity, is a belief that neoclassical or neoliberal uh, economists, myself in a minor way included, but more importantly, the people in senior roles in the, Biden, in the Obama and Clinton administrations, sold out the Americans. They sold them out by too little stimulus in 2008. They sold them out by letting China into WTO. They sold them out by not pushing for a minimum wage. And you put these two narratives together, which are both politically convenient and genuinely believed by large parts of the Biden administration and parts of the Republicans as well. And you have a very powerful sense that the US is maybe not going to be aggressively unilateral, but is going to be aggressively anti-China and aggressively, again, as Frank Franco and Daniel mentioned, looking after its self-interest narrowly defined. Um, this is probably not good for the long-term benefit of the US, but that's where we are. And so to me, the, the things that have to be kept in mind are first, I think the best hope is through plurilateralism rather than multilateralism, but pluralism being compatible with the multilateral institutions. And by pluralism, one can mean narrowly how it's defined in the WTO or more broadly subgroups of countries rather than having full memberships with individual member vetoes around specific issues, not necessarily around geographic organization. And so this in the positive sense gets us back to some of these global commons issues, make progress on international taxation as Marco rightly emphasized the US has shifted, make progress on, on green technology as again, everyone rightly acknowledges the Biden administration has, thank God, come back to Paris Accord, come back to some reality on that. Um, make progress on controlling the digital giants even though they're American headquartered. Um, these are things and possibly even progress on labor exploitation by China and others or, or bad debt around the world being exploited by China and others. And most of all, progress jointly among the rich countries on vaccinating the rest of the world. Um, so in that sense, I think there is hope. But the problem is, the flip side is that the Biden administration is going to view everything and sell everything domestically in terms of how this relates to competition or conflict with China. And we're already seeing that in the U.S. discussions about the, uh, the vaccination, about cyber issues, about technology transfer. And this puts EU, and I think when we were talking other actors like Russia, it's wrong to ignore Japan. Um, Japan has played a key role, particularly in the trade area in recent years, much more assertively than people had who had written it off thought it could. Um, that there is this, this going to be, you're with us or against us from the US which will fall disproportionately on the EU. And this is, doesn't contaminate everything, it doesn't destroy everything, but it makes it more difficult. And I think a number, and this is gonna to lead to a lot of hypocrisy and inconsistency from the Biden administration. So just to give you finally two examples on that. The first, as many people have pointed out, and my colleague Jacob Kierkegaard has been excellent in pointing out, the huge hypocrisy of the US talking about vaccines and, and Europe being protectionist now, whereas of course Europe has exported vast numbers of vaccines. China has exported vast numbers of vaccines and the US has exported almost none. And second, in the coming discussions of border adjustment on carbon, 
the U.S. is going to keep saying to the EU, or I should say the Biden administration is going to keep saying to the European Commission, please don't put on border adjustment taxes. We know we don't have a carbon price or a carbon tax, but we have all these subsidies. And let's have a very technical discussion of how our subsidies are almost equivalent to your carbon tax. But at the same time, they're going to turn to Brazil or India or China and say, you're destroying the rainforest. You're using too much coal. We're going to put a border adjustment tax on you. And so this is the reality of where we are. And so this is why, in the end, my optimism is very pragmatic and I think overlaps some with the three previous speakers. But it's about issues in the global commons where you can make progress. And Europe and Japan and others are just going to have to try to restrain the U.S. from forcing them to be too aggressive on China. Very much, Adam. Thank you for sharing with us your pragmatic optimism, if I may call it. And uh, I was uh, really impressed by what you said about the sad continu continuation uh, from uh, Trump to uh, uh, Biden uh, on uh, China and this conflictual view on China. So, of course, now let me turn to Renlin. Renlin is professor at the Institute of World Economics and Politics at the Chinese Academy on Social Science. So, seeing from Beijing, uh, Lin, mm -hmm. uh, what is your reaction? What is it, the point of view seen from the other side? Please, Rin. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. And thanks for T20 and the ESP to make this uh, virtual event possible. Actually, Compared with my uh, American um, colleagues, I'm not that much pessimistic because uh, when I received the invitation to attend this uh, meeting, I say I noticed the, the conference is uh, entitled EU, uh, US, China, the impossible triangle question mark. Actually, I tried my best to give answers to the question mark. And actually my answer is, uh, I disagree with impossible because I have uh, basically uh, four reasons. The, the first one is um, capability. Cap about capability, I think EU, US, China, all the three, actually they all have capability to make a contribution to global economic governance. Actually, for the major countries, they have more capability to give contributions. If we take the, uh, the statistic, I, I remember, according to the IMF, um, uh, IMF statistic last year, at the very end of 2020, actually American GDP accounts for 24.8% uh, of the world as a whole. And China accounts for 17.7% uh, to the world, and EU accounts for 17.8 percentage. So actually, to summarize the three, the three accounts for the uh, accounts for about over 60 percent of the world GDP. So actually, if you compare all of the three to the fourth, which is Japan, Japan has its GDP accounts for 5.9 percentage. Uh, of the world GDP as a whole. So according to this, we say all the three are the major players in the world, are the biggest econo uh, economic entity, and actually they have the capability to contribute to the global economic governance. That's my first point. And my second point is representative. Re about representative, I wanted to say that the, the major three, the three uh, entities, EU, US, China, actually they represent different voices, different uh, um, country, different country, uh, types of a country, different player characteristic in the world. For, for example, EU, US might represent <clears throat> the developed economy, and actually the two are different. For example, EU might be the, the traditional uh, developed world, developed economy, and the U.S. might be the actually emerging developed economy, and China represents actually the developed uh, economy and emerging economies as well. So actually, all the three have different backgrounds, have the different player characteristics. Actually, they could represent different voice in the world. So representativeness concerning about this, the three. If the three could coordinate, 
actually they will make a great contribution to represent the world as a whole. That is my second uh, uh, point. My, my third point about the, uh, the, the question mark I disagree is that actually uh, about willingness. It's all about willingness. Actually, we could say that uh, even though there might be some uh, scholars point about uh, hegemony decline, and actually U.S. is still the, the vital major power in the world, even though uh, Trump uh, withdrawn from a lot of uh, uh, international organizations, multilateral platforms, and actually we say somehow the return at, at the Biden uh, administration. And the euro is the traditional, the, the representative and the, the normative power uh, from after World War II, and it has a very big role in the multilateral world. So actually, I think you has the willingness to support this uh, multilateral world. And for China, uh, the, one of the emerging uh, markets, and actually China uh, made a lot of uh, uh, advice about to build a community of human destiny and to support the role of UN to support multilateralism. Actually, we see, also see the willingness as well. So the third point, capability, representativeness, willingness. I think the three have could have a role and should have a role and must have a role. It is not only on the interest of the three, but also on the interest of the world as whole. Well. My last point is about player characteristic. Why I talk about this point is that I disagree with a lot of um, essays, a lot of experts that conflict is the major voice in the future. I disagree. Because if we back to the classical game theory, Collaboration is possible, even though there are conflict interests. And if you compare the classical theory of game theory, and actually uh, the, 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 the collaboration based on conflict interest is the major form of cooperation. And another point back to which is backed up by the traditional trade theory. Pro probably some uh, uh, thing, uh, uh, the, the traditional thinking is that probably country of the same, uh, same trade make up the other's defici deficiency from their own surplus. But actually it is not like that, especially the modern trade theory. Actually, it is not a winner takes all world because even though we, we have countries who have comparative advantage capability to produce a particular good and service at a lower marginal and opportunity cost over the others. And actually, even though it has, it, it is this country more efficient in the production of all goods and it has absolute advantage in all goods, but it doesn't mean collaboration is not possible. It means exactly that both countries will gain by trading with the others, even though there might be one more efficient than the others. And this is exactly like we talk about the world today. There are conflicts among major powers. It is the true, it is the reality, but actually it doesn't mean collaboration is not possible. So based on the four points, I would say I'm more positive than, than my, uh, my colleagues. Um, so I, and I want to conclude with that, my answer to the question mark, the impossible triangle, I think it is possible and it's very important to keep the world in order with the three's coordination. And I really hope it could be China, it could be US and it could be, and it, might be the European Union to be the bridge that to make this kind of a dialogue possible. Thank you, Antonia. Thank you very much, Lynn. So looks like so far optimism is winning over pessimism, which is not exactly what I was <laughs> expecting at the beginning. Still, I mean, it is a very good <laughs> news. But now let me move to Carmen Reiner. Thank you very much, Carmen, for being with us uh, again. Carmen is uh, the Vice President, Chief Economist of World Bank Group. Uh, uh, Carmen, I mean, yes, there is, you know, some optimism. Still, I mean, there are, you know, very severe 
bad consequences for developing, least developing countries. So seen from the point of view of the World Bank and the effect of these growing tensions and conflicts among these three big players, uh, uh, what is your view? And what are the prospects uh, and the suggestions you may, you may give? Please come. So, you know, I think um, before actually turning to that, you know, we've all discussed very briefly our own vision of globalization. And I just want to say something at the more general level of that, of where I think we're, we have been going and what COVID may have done uh, to the trend. Uh, that's number one. Then number two, I will focus on some of the issues that the, are, are much more connected to um, the uh, role of the bank uh, in working with its membership on both the trade side and the finance side as it relates to U.S., Europe, China, triangle that's laid out here. So those are the two things that I'm going to focus on. Uh, first, on globalization, just sort of as a historical footnote, I, I would observe that, you know, globalization has had its ups and downs. It's very long cycles. Uh, globalization surged in the latter part of the 19th century, and it peaked uh, just before World War I. Now, after two world wars and a global depression, there was minimalist globalization at the end of Bretton Woods. I don't think we are, uh, you know, looking at that kind of draconian setback to globalization. But I think we've been seeing a sequence of setbacks to globalization, which in my view peaked around 2008, before 2007, 2008, before the global financial crisis. I think the global financial crisis put a dent on globalization and perhaps a gross simplistic way of summarizing that, but nonetheless, uh, I think it's, it's a relevant one. Uh, you know, you, you had uh, global trade volumes growing more rapidly than incomes. Uh, through 2008 and the decade ending 2008, annual growth of, of, of trade volume was, was around 6%. After the global financial crisis, it was cut in more than half. Uh, then we've had Brexit within the context uh, of Europe. Um, then we had the Trump-China war. Uh, and I, 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 I rather agree with much of what Adam said, that even though uh, what we are seeing is, is an administration, a Biden administration that is much more geared to working with multilaterals in the context of the OECD, the context of the G20, the G7, and so on. Uh, but nonetheless, I do think that the, 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 the tension between China and the U.S. Is, is, is very much alive and well. So I think globalization uh, hit a peak a while ago. And, and, and I am concerned, and, this, and here is connected to concerns in the bank, that the COVID crisis, you know, in the co during, during this, this once in a century pandemic, what we're also seeing is the reemergence of the term resilience and a concern, of course, at the bank and, and in many circles is that resilient begins to equate with self-reliance and self-reliant uh, becomes to equate with more inward uh, looking uh, strategies. And so, you know, we will see when the dust settles. Certainly the most dire predictions of the WTO, which said, you know, early last year said, you know, global, grow, uh, global trade could 
could fall anywhere between like 13 and 32 percent. Certainly the worst outcome did not materialize. But I think it remains to be seen after the dust settles in this pandemic, whether we don't see a larger tendency across countries to, in their efforts to become more resilient, also become more inward looking. Uh, um, this is, you know, uh, at this stage, uh, not a fact, it, but, but, but as I said, we, we've already been edging down at the path of globalization. Now, what, are, what do I think are some of the challenges in the context of the work that I see at the bank? Um, you know, well, they, the first challenge I've already mentioned, which is actually uh, working with countries to avoid, you know, uh, avoid a, a return to any kind of protectionism. We saw spikes in food protectionism. Uh, we are seeing it in the advanced uh, and emerging markets and everywhere uh, in varying degrees also on protectionism when it comes to medical. Um, it, and, and so, it, you know, working in the multilateral uh, context on the trade side is, is, of course, you know, and avoiding uh, for a new a new wave of protectionism is one dimension that's very important. The other dimension that's very important, and here it will be a new test. I don't know uh, how that test test will play out, but China has a major new role uh, in the multilateral community. Um, it China became the the largest official lender in the course of the last 15 years. And now we have a lot of countries in debt servicing difficulties. Of the 74 countries that are eligible for the debt suspension initiative, more than half of them are either in debt distress or at a high risk of debt distress, which means that in the context so for years, we know that that I think the Paris Club wanted to bring China in uh, and that didn't happen. But now in the context of the G20, uh, we have uh, seen the emergence of the common framework uh, with the participation of very important participation of the major creditors. Uh, which encompasses, of course, the U.S., the EU, and importantly, China. Um, so this is going to be a, a real test, right? Because um, what this means is part, an important part of the importance of the common framework is that there are, if there are going to be many restructuring, there's already three lined up for as test cases, if you will, for the common framework, uh, Chad, Ethiopia, and Zambia, uh, it will be importantly testing that multilateralism because the idea is intercreditor equity, uh, which means that um, China will move from its doing its own thing in terms of debt restructuring bilaterally, which has been the model thus far, uh, meaning uh, if the, you know, Republic, the Democratic Republic of Congo had Chinese debts, those debts were bilaterally negotiated uh, with China. And uh, now those bilateral negotiations are going to be replaced uh, by a multilateral uh, creditor committee uh, uh, arrangement. So it will be what I am getting at is that we're, the, the working well of the traditional creditors from Europe and the U.S., with China as the new entrance, going to be a major issue for many developing countries uh, going forward, because 
a large, large share of countries that will be needing debt restructuring as we move ahead. This is part of the COVID legacy. Uh, do have uh, big exposures um, to, to they, they have, they owe significantly uh, uh, to, to China. And so that is, I think, going to be a critical, but as yet unknown, uh, seeing how, how that will uh, play out. But from where I sit, uh, that is going to be, as far as its effects on developing countries, a very, you know, I, I hope with optimism that the triangle can work for the sake of developing countries, because if not, they're really looking at, you know, the proverbial lost decade, which in effect for many countries wasn't the lost decade, it was a lost couple of decades. Uh, let me stop there. Thank you very much, Carmen. Thank you for this very broad overview, also on the potential effect of, uh, of course, this iteration on, uh, uh, specifically also on uh, developing countries and least developing countries. But we still have 10 minutes, more or less. So I would make another round around, uh, around the virtual table, uh, asking you in particular, what is your point of view on uh, uh, this, you know, possible uh, reconciliation between the US and the EU. I mean, first, if it is really possible, to what extent it is possible, and if it is going to be beneficial also for the rest of the world, or if it is not creating or going to create, you know, new frictions with China and with, uh, with other states. So I'll ask you to be very, uh, very brief, I will start from uh, uh, Franco again. This Franco, you have to unmute. All right. Well, I think we have no alternative. I mean, we, we must have to side with the US uh, in many, many issues, but this must not, uh, but not bring us to uh, you know, to, to lose completely our strategic autonomy, especially diplomatic dealing with the rest of the world, and particularly with China. Uh, if we take, uh, you know, it, as I was saying before, if we keep separate tables, there is a lot of room to play a very complex diplomatic uh, play. The important thing that the, the, the Europeans uh, are, 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 uh, are joined, uh, uh, stay together. They, they act in a, in a consistent fashion because if, if there's no... Uh, if there's no common strategy, then uh, then Europe simply cannot play any role uh, anywhere. So first, first, it, Europe should uh, concentrate and, and unify and centralize its uh, its diplomatic attitude in in this in, in strategy. And second, it has to play on on the whole on the whole, on the whole tables. But uh, but the, the the convergence with the United States on many many aspects is automatic. I think. Daniel, do you agree on this uh, automatic convergence with the U.S.? I think there's automatic convergence at the political level, at the level of declaration. I doubt there will be automatic convergence at the level of actions taken. Um, I mean, with the advent on Biden, Europe has lost the political high ground or the moral high ground, uh, which now has been occupied very much uh, by the US, and uh, which I think Adam outlined is very much used now in a very efficient way. So in that sense, as uh, Franco said, the EU has little choice but to basically align with the Americans politically in declarations. But what would be the actual, the actions that follow I very much doubt that the EU will really undertake things which would hinder the flow of trade between the EU and China. There have been more declarations also in the last days about uh, screening investment and so on. So far, these have been, in my view, paper tigers. 
intentions of intent, uh, sorry, declarations of intent, and they show that we have a strategic autonomy, we can do something, but actually the investment flows from China to the EU are anyway rather small. So I think uh, this is the way I would see uh, things develop going forward. Big declarations on transatlantic solidarity, but little action by the EU on the ground. Marco, do you agree? I mean, there is r r concrete uh, down-to-earth room for collaboration, or it will be a lot of, you know, formal declaration and no more, a little more than that. This okay, let me um, answer this, and then I would like ask, I would like to ask, a diff un ask and answer a different question. Please. Um, the, on this one here. Um, I think that, uh, okay, first of all, I, uh, on, on Daniel, the moral high ground, I mean, we are all happy that uh, climate change taxation has become, uh, uh, you know, common ground. Uh, so it's not losing the moral high ground, it's imposing the agenda. So this, I would say, I would, I would have a different reading than that. Uh, second point on uh, the screening and foreign subsidies, uh, they are not declaration, it's a proposal of a regulation. Now, let's see what happens uh, in the council, it has to be adopted by the member states, but it is, uh, you know, much more than a loose, uh, a loose declaration. At the same time, I think uh, it is true that um, we have to work together with the uh, with the U.S. It's not going to be easy on all uh, ground. I mean, it is true that, uh, uh, as Adam uh, uh, put it, um, uh, the under Biden, the U.S. Uh, continues to be a reluctant global leader, uh, uh, so that uh, uh, we'll have to put flesh uh, on the bones on that uh, front. But I think the common interests are are uh, uh, overwhelming uh, on that. My second uh, point is the question you did not ask, but I ask it myself and I answer it: uh, is whether um, uh, looking at Lynn, we are ready to change the title of the event. So should we take out the should we take out the question mark and maybe the transition? <laughs> we have never done, they, we have never done it at ESP, but we will remove it from the uh, from the, no, no, okay. the conclusion of this. So we take out the question mark and we 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 uh, move, we uh, take out the impossible, replaced by possible. Okay, uh, the possible trial. Also, oh, is this the? Um, I don't think so. Frankly, I think the title mm -hmm. of the event at the end of this discussion should remain what it was at the beginning of the discussion. Mm -hmm. Let me just one, give a, just a very personal thing. I was, uh, I mean, I gave uh, a talk at Columba, Columbia in October 2018, 2018, so not long ago, but uh, on uh, uh, moving towards inclusive multilateralism. And I, had, I fished back a slide, uh, which was, what is the role of China? And you know the tasks there that one would expect from China were the following: further progress uh, to tackle steel excess capacity, acknowledge and address the role of state-owned enterprises, ensuring a level playing field on export finance, enhancing debt transparency so that bilateral lending to least developed countries uh, uh, is compatible with international best practices, active engagement with the Paris Club. I think on virtually all of this, we have either gone back, so going in the wrong direction, or made very, very little progress. Uh, virtually on all this. There is a bit of a question mark on, on debt transparency. Uh, I hope Carmen is right that uh, uh, we get, uh, let's say, this G20 initiative, uh, in a sense, leads to common engagement. At the same time, I mean, I've seen a recent, very recent study on um, clauses uh, in uh, uh, debt, you know, lending contracts by China with uh, the, with um, least developed countries on tra on transparency, not disclosing, uh, uh, etc., which uh, I think are troublesome. So uh, I think. Uh, we are not uh, going, uh, we have not gone in the past years in the right direction. And I think the uh, issue of, uh, let's say, plurilateralism and uh, not naive multilateralism, I think, is behind also 
the acknowledgement that uh, uh, of a more heterogeneous preferences and don't need, I think, to keep pushing. So we are not going to change the title of the event, uh, uh, in my view. Okay, so we, we, we will keep it, but we will ask Lynn. But Adam, uh, briefly, unfortunately, because we are running out of time, uh, do you believe in this renewed, you know, transatlantic relationship? Is it beneficial also to others? I think it's hopeful that it could happen, that it could be. I want to emphasize the common thread between Daniel and Carmen, Carmen's long perspective and Carmen's warning about misuse of resilience. It's going to have to be built issue by issue. And the EU can push the US, and frankly, in some areas, China can push the US to be more beneficial for the rest of the world than it currently is being. Thank you so much. Lynn, so we are going to keep, yes. we are going to keep the, the time. Uh -huh. We are not going to change uh -huh. it. So what do you think? <laughs> okay. I mean, do, you, do you really, so to say, fear, uh -huh. you know, this reunion between the EU and the, EU, the US? Do you really believe in, it, in that? Actually, I, I think, um, I, I think we, we should consider from issue to issue. And I, my personal support is multilateralism as a whole, which is more um, beneficial to the world as a whole. And actually, the, the reality is not so positive. So we have to consider actually in which issue areas we could identify the, the common interest or identify the conflict interest among the three. So uh, that is the reality. And uh, I, I wanted to have a little bit of response to the former uh, comments as well, because you talked about um, the, the debt issue and the uh, foreign investment issue as well. Actually, I, I want to refer to the statistic of G20 last year, the first round of um, debt moratorium. Actually, China contributes to be the first, uh, the, the top one to, to, to the debt moratorium. Uh, it's about uh, to, uh, to delay the debt to 26 uh, countries, less developed countries countries and actually about uh, $2.1 billion. That is the, the oldest statistic. I, and I know this uh, statistic is also growing uh, to this year. So actually, um, uh, I, I want to say it doesn't mean that um, uh, we, we have these issues and actually collaboration about uh, infrastructure investment is not possible. And uh, actually it's very demanding, um, to, uh, very demanding because um, on the uh, first hand, actually the only the bilateral debt issue is not true because we, uh, last month I talked with the expert from uh, World Bank. Actually we are talking about how to uh, reduce the, the investment risk and how to reduce the debt risk multilaterally as well. That is actually the multilateral dialogue is going on. So we have to follow the progress. And uh, so only the bilateral debt issue is not true. And secondly, I think uh, China's contribution about investment to the less developed countries, especially the infra infrastructure investment is very important. Uh, if we think about, consider about the issue linkage, actually this kind of investment especially infrastructure, how contribute to the po poverty reduction. And this also release, reduce the immigration issue, immigration problem of US and Europe. Lynn, that I, that is my answer. I, I have to stop here with you because okay. we're really running out <laughs> okay. of time. So Carmen, the okay. last words from you, and particularly mm -hmm. from the point of view of the World Bank uh, on, you know, mm -hmm. this, you know possible cooperation, mm -hmm. renewed cooperation, uh, if you know, it, it would be beneficial in your view or, or not coming from the uh, World Bank. Please, Carmen. So, you know, um, I very much highlighted uh, that the way forward in terms of helping uh, developing countries will importantly involve uh, cooperation uh, between Europe, the U.S., uh, China, and also other large non-Paris club uh, lenders as well, like Saudi Arabia and 
and and and and to a lesser degree India. Uh, but the jury is still out. Now, I I, I want to the issue about transparency remains an issue. Um, I'm very aware of the study that was cited on contracts, looking at a uh, uh, hundred contracts, Chinese contracts that had, you know, a lot of non-disclosure clauses and so on. Uh, the question is, does the common framework, which was agreed to last fall, supersede that so that as the creditor committee, which it's doing in real time, right? This, this is not a hypothetical. The creditor committee on Chad, which is the first test case, is moving forward. Will all of that, uh, you know, the prior contracts uh, be superseded? That's, it, it'll be a big test case. And the issue of transparency will loom very large. It is still a very much debated uh, issue between uh, China and, and, and on one side and the U.S. and Europe in the other. Very much debated in any of the G20 uh, fora and all. So, so that, that issue remains alive. But I think, you know, I don't want to prejudge the success or failure uh, of the common framework. But without, uh, you know, full engagement from China, I can tell you it it will not work. Um, and there, I think uh, the disclosure dimension is very important uh, because the common framework is grounded on equal intercred, you know, equal treatment across creditors. And a lot of the contracts, as was noted and revealed in this study, has, uh, you know, there are a lot of, there's a lot of um, collateral uh, in the contracts, a lot of uh, escrow accounts as collateral. So making sure that, you know, all the creditors are playing with full information is going to be a critical test for China's engagement in this. And, and you know, we, we, will, we will cross that bridge as as we cross it, you know, uh, it's but I wouldn't to conclude, I would not undersell the importance uh, of the G20 agreement uh, last fall. It is the first pass at having an agreement uh, that also uh, uh, includes China, which, as I said, is critical. To, they're the largest official creditor. Thank you very much, Carmen, for uh, also reminding all of us, I mean, that we don't know if it is going to be a possible or an impossible triangle. Still, it is a triangle. And of course, you know, China uh, needs to be, uh, to solve many global challenges, to face many ch global challenges successfully, uh, needs to be involved. I mean, we, we definitely all agree uh, on that. So. I thank you very much, of course, for your attention. In particular, let me thank Marco Buti for really helping us, you know, for co-promoting basically, you know, this, uh, this, this event. So thank you again for your participation. Thanks, many thanks, of course, to the audience. Uh, please, of course, follow us for the other ESP and T20 events. Thank you. Bye-bye.